Greg, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, John. You do an incredible amount of writing and recently you've launched, I think, a tremendously interesting book that's had a surprisingly strong reception, as I see it, God is Good For You, A Defense of Christianity in Troubled Times. Was it hard to write the book? Well, John, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be talking to you. It, it was kind of really a lifetime's decision, you know. I, I started in journalism 40 years ago and I, I used to respect the old secular view that you didn't talk too much about religion in Australia so that we wouldn't quarrel about it. But in, the, in my 40 years in journalism, I've seen the culture become more and more hostile to Christianity. And uh, I think I felt that uh, this is, culture was going to lose something profoundly important and it was doing it absentmindedly. It wasn't paying any attention to what was at stake. And then part, partly I had a journalistic instinct. This is an incredibly good story, this story of Christianity. Uh, great material and in journalism you're always searching for good material and then finally um, I thought that uh, you know the whole object of a journalist's life is to tell the truth and the most important truth is the truth of Christianity so if I if I had a, a lifetime of writing millions of words and speaking millions of words on TV and radio and didn't mention the most important thing that would be a bit weird uh, uh, overall and it's moved off the bookshelves, hasn't it? It has. It's done surprisingly well. Um, the publishers have been uh, delighted and thrilled. It's officially a bestseller. Um, as we're sitting here, it's had five reprints. Um, I think I've worked out a way, John, to become the very best in your field. Enter a field in which there are no other participants. <laughs> so, you know, sort of secular... Secular media books in defence of Christianity, there are no others. I mean, wh one of the things that motivated me was you, you walk into a bookshop today and you'll see uh, a section called Religion and Spirituality or something. There'll be a shelf of books which are basically yoga tips or something like this, you know, thin thighs and feel good about yourself. There'll be half a shelf of books about Buddhism. I love, love Buddhism, no, no criticism of that. There'll be a few books attacking Christianity. The New Atheists will be there, Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. And there won't be a single book explaining or defending Christianity. And I thought, how weird is that? Uh, people go into a bookshop they can't, they can't get hold of. They won't see, have presented to them the most important uh, truths in life. So uh, I thought I could add this tiny little soupçon to the great ocean of, uh, of human discourse. But it's proved to be a bit more than a tiny little soup song because you've been talking about it a lot, radio, television, um, you've been asked to speak uh, on it many times. What sort, how would you describe the reaction to the book? John, I've been uh, really thrilled at the reaction of the book and from a lot of people that I wouldn't have expected. Um, uh, the, it's had very nice reviews, in, including in the media companies that I'm not associated with, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Canberra Times and The Age. Um, I've had a lot of really interesting discussions about it on the ABC and I've got to say I've been very well treated. Perhaps it's just the novelty value, but the most interesting media interview I did was with uh, Richard Glover on the Sydney ABC and uh, two really interesting aspects of it. Firstly, his questions were so shrewd and penetrating and he said at one point, he said, you nearly had me on page 51 when you talked about how complex and unlikely our life and our universe is. Richard's a conscientious atheist, but he, he said I nearly had him there. The other thing was, though, that after that interview, he received a deluge of, of negative reaction from a lot of listeners who were saying, how dare you promote Christianity uh, and, and the like in, in a radio program, to which he said, well, look, you know, you'd hardly accuse the ABC of constantly promoting Christianity. So there is that undercurrent of hostility and mockery and dismissal. But the people who've interacted with me about this book have been generally very kind and I'm very grateful for it. As someone who believes, as I do and I'm sure you do, in the separation of church and state, one of the things that troubles me deeply, though, is that, you, and you've just alluded to it, there's a profound ignorance in today's world of what Christianity is, point one, and secondly, how it's shaped our culture? Well, I think that's absolutely right, John. So I do think there is a crisis of faith 
uh, and religious belief throughout the West, by which I mean Western Europe, North America, Australia and New Zealand. The rest of the world, incidentally, is on fire with religious sentiment. Yeah. Uh, all through Africa, Christian, Christianity is on fire. Uh, in China, there are more Christians than there are members of the Chinese Communist Party. Pentecostalism is, is, is just so vibrant in, in Latin America. But in the West, we're, we're, we're losing belief. And belief is not an act of the intellect, it's an act of the will. But you can't believe something which outrages the intellect. And part of the crisis of belief in the West is a crisis of knowledge. So it is astonishing. There's vast sociological evidence about this. The lack of elementary knowledge that people have, even who have some affiliation with a Christian denomination, of what their own denomination believes, much less, um, much less you know, the, the great story of Christianity. And then the second point you make, the way that Christianity has shaped our culture. So here's a paradox, John, which you and I will rejoice in. Christianity is a universal religion. It's open to every human being. The majority of Christians today are not Westerners. But Western civilization has been profoundly shaped by a dialogue within Christianity about the nature of the good life, about the nature of human conscience, about human dignity arising from every individual having an immortal soul and a special relationship with God. And all of this is wiped away so that if you go to a, a, a campus, a big Australian campus and ask a typical undergraduate, what does Western civilization stand for? They'll say genocide, sexism, colonialism. And they've been kind of in an act of educational vandalism prevented from knowing that, that human rights emerged out of Christianity, that the most radical pro-human rights statement in the ancient world was in the book of Genesis, where it said humanity was created in God's image. And, and all of the long dialogue after that for 2000 years, you know, the Christian impulse to abolish slavery, e everything else, it's all disappeared from, uh, from consciousness. Not understood. Yeah, not, and really not taught, not talked about. Um, One of the things that I've noticed in the commentary quite a bit and it's happened with this conversation series, is that whenever anybody points to the arc of Christian influence being overwhelmingly beneficial, there's a certain class of aggr aggressive secularist out there who simply wants to deny it with cheap shots, no grappling with the issues. Slavery is a good example. So instead of acknowledging that the charge against slavery really did come out of Christianity in England, that's where it came from. Yes they'll say something like, no, the Bible justifies slavery, uh, or it didn't happen for centuries. They obviously haven't actually looked at the history of it and they're not prepared to argue the facts, which I find quite disturbing. Indeed, uh, John, and uh, I tell you, writing this book was enormous fun. Uh, it, uh, it, it's almost wicked and criminal that you can have this much fun in your professional life. Perhaps you did as Deputy Prime Minister, but... Um, uh, I wish. <laughs> It was a great honour, a great privilege, but uh, the fun moments were sort of sometimes strung out a bit. One, one element of the fun was, was, was reading the, the Bible seriously, but an, another element of the fun was, although I'd had an interest in, you know, history and medieval history and so on, trying to come to grips with this more systematically. Now, Christians, of course, in the early in their early incarnation had no power to abolish slavery. They had no power to do anything. But how did they treat slaves? So St. Paul in, is, is returning a slave to his owner and he says, you must treat this man as though you were welcoming me. He is your brother. You must treat him with dignity. And from the very earliest, Christianity taught that slaves and women and every marginalized person, foreigners, Samaritans, everybody, uh, were human beings and had a divine relationship with God. And the implication of that was against slavery. Of course, you know, there have been billions of Christians, lots of them have done bad things, including owning slaves. But I, I do outline in the book, very early on, uh, Christian leaders, you know, in the second and third century, were rebuking uh, a noblemen who said, I, I bought 20 slaves and there's an early uh, bishop who says, 
How can you say you've bought human beings? Human beings don't belong to you. They belong to God. And in a sense, they don't even belong to God. They belong to themselves, their human dignity, their freedom. Now, Christians didn't always live up to that. But this understanding of human dignity came in the ancient world from Christianity. And that understanding of human dignity has become very, very important to our freedoms. To tease that out a bit, we're now in a situation where the reality is that in the West, as you say, this, is a, this will not be a century of unbelief. This is not going to be the age of secularism globally. It's an age of tremendous and extraordinary ferment and discussion around and exploration of belief systems. It's just the West that's decided to go down this road of quite aggressive secularism. Having the scrub got out of the public square, because that's basically what's happened, what goes with it, I think, is an understanding of our shared humanity. If I were to pose the question to you, given that not so very long ago, a very substantial number of people went regularly to a Christian church somewhere where they were constantly reminded that there was a higher authority and that they had responsibilities to their neighbours and that being self-absorbed, if you like, narcissistic was not appropriate. What takes the place? What is the vision now that we should, that, that the secular world says we should adopt of one another? And how do we find a basis for living with one another when we disagree? So John, that's a very profound question to which secular society has no answer and in a sense, neither do I. But, um, you know, it's been wide, wisely observed that when people stop believing in Christianity, they don't typically believe in nothing, they believe in anything. We're seeing the weirdest things emerge in the West. We're seeing neo-Nazi, uh, we're seeing Nazi symbols in American demonstrations. We're seeing communist symbols in British demonstrations. We're seeing uh, popularity of, of witchcraft, uh, the so-called Wicca religion. But your, your question is really the loss of purpose and a common a common purpose. I think uh, modern liberalism is kind of going mad because liberalism really grew out of Christianity. And when you, when you wipe out all of its roots, you remove it from a tradition, you remove it from common sense, and it, it has no constraints on itself. So uh, it pursues a kind of mad drive for equality. It pursues a mad drive for historical retribution. Uh, it, it elevates um, victim status so that everybody is searching uh, to become a victim. And it goes down this terrible dark road of identity politics, which is a rebuttal of the universalism which came with Christianity. So and I, to which, by the way, if I can interrupt, the Labor Party until quite recent times was quite deeply committed and is now almost totally abandoned. Well, I do, I do think the Labor Party is making a terrible mistake indulging uh, this identity politics. Now, I think the universalism of God is evident in the Old Testament. So, you know, God sends Jonah to preach to the Ninevites. That indicates that he was the God of the Ninevites as well as the God of the Israelites. But, you know, it's contestable in the Old Testament, but it's absolutely explicit in the New Testament. St. Paul says there is neither... Uh, Greek nor Roman, Jew nor Gentile, man nor woman, we're all one in Jesus Christ. By the way, John, it's very unusual for me to be quoting scripture as a foreign editor of The Australian, but, but to look at the content of Christianity, I do think both the universalism and the distinctive uh, quality of the human experience is under deep threat when you remove God, because the way that human beings have been conceived of having human dignity is that they are a divine, immortal creature. Now, if you come to the view in the end that human beings are nothing other than matter and energy, just the same as a table or a plant or a cockroach, in the end you say, well, well, what claim for special consideration do they have? They don't have any particular claim. And if your uh, message to everyone is just follow your own dream, well, what happens when your dream is to kill 100 people or to have sex with six-year-olds or something? What, what restrains you from that dream? And then finally, Viktor Frankl, who wrote uh, those magnificent books about um, his experience in Hitler's death camps, he argues that the, the essential quality of life 
the thing which allowed people, some people to survive the death camps, but which everyone needed, even in the death camps, was meaning and purpose. And if life is just a sort of a, a, an ocean cruise in which you try to distract yourself until you die, I think that can breed a kind of existential panic and, and that can have very ugly consequences for individuals and for society as a whole. There are those who will say, no, 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 none of this came out of Christianity. It was the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a repudiation of burning witches and of crusades. That was the genesis of all of these good things. I think that's a very inadequate understanding, frankly, of the major moral impulses around this dignity of the individual uh, and respect for others, even when you disagree with them, that has its genesis much more, I think, in a Christian worldview than in what came out of the Enlightenment? Well, I think you're right, John. The, um, the old Disneyland version of history uh, was that Jesus was a nice bloke, uh, kind of a you know, social worker, uh, progressive in his time, would have supported uh, full paid maternity leave if that had been an issue. Um, was killed by the repressive state authorities. The early Christians tried to live out his teachings uh, heroically. Then Constantine, the emperor, came along and made Christianity a state religion. And from that point, for the next thousand years or so, it was the Dark Ages. Nothing good happened. It was all superstition, ruled by, uh, ruled by uh, Savonarola-like uh, evil Christian figures. And then we got the Renaissance, where people started to go to art galleries and look at nude statues and eat smashed avocado and life became fun again. They repudiated God and then in the Enlightenment they repudiated God a bit more and, and focused on humanity. And then Christianity's influence happily waned. Now, that's the Disneyland view of history and it's wrong in every respect. It's completely wrong in every respect. It may be convenient, but being convenient doesn't make it right. So John, I, I think the Enlightenment uh, uh, was a very good thing. But most of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment were Christians and they used Christian moral categories. Um, there were some publicists, <coughs> excuse me, of the Enlightenment who were kind of anti-Christian and anti-church and so on. But the Enlightenment itself, I think, represents continuity with Christianity. Now, to, to digress in a sense for a second, I was greatly influenced by the work of an Oxford scholar Larry Siddentop, who wrote a wonderful book called Inventing the Individual. Now, as I understand it, uh, Larry Siddentop is not a, a believing Christian himself, but he is a great, great scholar. And he, this book, uh, I, I have a chapter which really deals with medieval Christianity, and um, I draw on a number of historians, but I'm, I'm particularly influenced by him and, and certainly converted by his thesis. His thesis is that everything we value in modern liberalism had been thought through by Christians by the end of the, or by the later period of the Middle Ages. And this was a continuous dialogue. So there's an early Pope who's confronted with the question, do infidels have immortal souls? And you know, he gives matter some thought and says, well, yes, of course they do. They have immortal souls and therefore they have human rights uh, because they're human beings. The, the disposition of Christianity towards women and girls was better than anything the world had ever known. Um, Christianity pioneered the idea that marriage was an institution of reciprocal love, and this had not been the case with marriage before. There's a, a sociology, a, a historical sociologist of religion, Rodney Stark, who argues that the pro-women, pro pro-girl element of Christianity was the key to its expansion because in the ancient world it was typical for female babies to be killed because people valued sons. Christian families didn't kill their daughters, so they had lots of daughters and they're much happier families as a result and, and the daughters tended to convert the husbands that they married. All the way through there was a, a dialogue about what was the good life. Uh, there was a dialogue about what was right for the church to decide, what was right for the state to decide, and what was that realm of individual conscience. This was not a, a newfangled thing. Um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the medieval theologian, argues that uh, if a Muslim converts to Christianity under threat of the sword, this uh, is to his discredit. 
because it outrages his conscience. So if he, if he believes in Islam, he should not convert to Christianity under force. And the implication is, of course, you shouldn't use force to create a conversion, but it's also a recognition in deepest medieval Christianity of the primacy of conscience. Now, the Enlightenment built on all this. Of course, medieval Christianity had lots and lots of corruption. That's the, the nature of our fallen state as human beings. But this dialogue, tremendously positive and fascinating and uh, full of critique uh, about the corruption at the time. I mean, uh, Dante's um, Divine Comedy is a, is, a, is a brilliant critique of the corruption of medieval Christianity. It places Pope Boniface in the eighth circle of hell. Even the ABC probably wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> and, and all of this is kind of, it's just wiped away. It, it doesn't exist. You know, our kids are not allowed to hear about it. It's, it's censored knowledge somehow. So I, I think, um, you know, one of the countless ways in which Christianity is defamed is that its history is, is washed out of our consciousness. Well, we should never forget uh, the uh, remark that uh, Marx made, deprive the people of their history and they're easily persuaded. Mm -hmm. To work backwards on that, it strikes me that people today are very easily persuaded and often confuse thinking and feeling. Look, I think that's a very profound observation. Um, if I can engage in a bit of outrageous name dropping here. I, I, once, uh, I once had lunch with Henry Kissinger and uh, he made a remark, which he's probably made to a lot of other people to me. He said, we've never had <clears throat> the ability more quickly to access knowledge. So, you, you know, your smartphone can tell you anything, can tell you, you know, what the Apollinarian heresy was about. It can tell you what uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez had for dinner, can tell you everything. But he said, we've never had less ability to place that knowledge in a meaningful context and a meaningful narrative. And um, the way that public policy is discussed now is in the language of feelings. And the way that you establish your virtue in public life is by an exaggerated sense of outrage. But the problem is, if the debate is between John Anderson and Kim Beasley in our politics, it's between two extremely civilised human beings, neither of whom should generate outrage. So you, you have to manufacture things to, to be outraged about. and. Um, as a result, you get an emotionalism which is divorced from the substance which ought to create emotions. I, I really think politics runs best when it's not very emotional, you know. I would hate to think that the deepest thing in my life was politics. Uh, the deepest thing in your life is your family and your belief and so on. And, and politics is kind of a discussion about, about how we run. whereas. I think identity politics and social media and a lot of other things combine to make politics an intense, hostile, shouting, uh, quasi-violent, uh, emotional festival, uh, which is a very unsatisfactory, very bad way to run politics, I think. Well, you've now got the advent of social media and all the platforms that it depends upon that were supposedly going to enhance democracy, but seem to me to be doing precisely the opposite at the moment, at least. You've got a rudimentary public square that anybody now can participate in if they want to be a keyboard warrior. And we've never seen such levels of vitriol and emotion at the expense of reasoned debate, it seems to me. It's so bad that Neil Ferguson argues that it may yet destabilise our very way of life, our governments. Nowhere, it seems to me, do we find greater clarity around this breakdown of the respect for one another's dignity and standing. I think that's right. Uh, we have to tame social media. One of the central questions of our time is this. Are we going to impose on social media the normal standards of civilised behaviour that we expect in normal life? Or is social media going to impose on normal life its own viciousness and amorality? Um, social media is having often very violent consequences, uh, especially in countries um, not, not quite as rich as Australia. So 
uh, you get accused, say, in a, you know, I'm not picking on Islam here, but say in a Muslim country, someone is falsely accused of blasphemy on social media. A huge frenzy is whipped up about this. And then some other warrior on social media publishes the person's physical address. And people go around and kill them. That, that's, that's happening in many parts of the world. Now, we're not at that stage in Australia, but the level of vitriol and abuse is astounding. I was at a dinner party once um, with uh, two small businessmen. Uh, and so here's a story I'm telling against conservatives. The guy was a kind of conservative activist and in normal conversation he was a civilised human being. But he showed me with delight the tweets he was sending to certain Labor politicians he didn't like. And they were vile, full of abuse, foul language, four letter words, things that he would never do. And I thought, how did this person develop this Janus face? I mean, how did he become two people? A normal person when you have dinner with him and a grotesque, abusive, and uh, you know, this is not, in my view, consigned to left or right. I, I, I mean, I'd have to say there are plenty of right-wing, uh, you know, keyboard warriors who are as vicious and nasty as the left-wing keyboard warriors. I, I myself don't do Twitter or Facebook, although there are a lot of fake Twitters and Facebooks which pretend to be me, God bless them, but, um, but the, uh, the deluge of foul abuse is astonishing and it, it, it's okay for people like us who are used to controversy, but it's, it's very disturbing for, for a normal person who doesn't, you know, who wants to participate in a debate but doesn't expect to be vilified and attacked uh, in this way. And of course, the thing that works is, again, outrageous emotion. So even sensible people, the bit that is going to go viral is the bit that is most unreasonable. And, and so even sensible people have an incentive to intersperse their public life with crazy, crazy uh, effusions. Mm. And, and I suspect it's helping making us uh, more difficult to govern at a time when people are looking for governments to be more effective. That social media dynamic is actually making it harder than ever to meet people's expectations. To change gears then and to lead directly from the things we've been talking about into what you write about uh, so well as foreign affairs uh, editor at The Australian, uh, the world we now live in. Uh, you wrote a particularly brilliant piece uh, back in uh, August, a strong cultural base as essential as sound politics. The first question I think is, is our problem today primarily one of policy or is it of culture? Well, John, uh, it's, it's ni nice of you to recall that column. Uh, I do believe that politics is downstream of culture. I think politics proceeds from culture. Now, it's not, it's not an either or, because politics also influences culture and political leadership can have a cultural consequence. You know, we, uh, I think as a people, we ad admired the way people like John Howard and, and Bob Hawke conducted themselves in their public lives. You know, there, there was something admirable. So that has a, that goes, that feeds back into the culture, that, that has an effect on culture. But I think uh, politics is downstream of culture and the, the, the crisis today that we're experiencing in the West is first of all a cultural crisis more than a, than a political crisis. And uh, it's partly a crisis of knowledge, as I say, that nobody understands what our culture is about. It's partly a loss of purpose, that people are looking for purpose in their lives and can't find it. And when you remove the transcendent, uh, you remove the basis of compromise, because if there's nothing but politics, then you, you have to win. Whereas if, if there are higher and greater and much more profound realities, you know, you can take a more, uh, slightly more relaxed view about politics. Uh, well, you'll win a bit, I'll win a bit, um, we'll compromise on this, uh, still don't like that policy, I'll campaign some more about it. But you don't have this febrile, uh, febrile quality. But I, I do 
but look, I'm being a bit mealy mouthed here, John. Let me actually tell you what I believe. I don't believe that Western society can function well without religious belief. Um, it's, you don't believe in religious truths so that society will function well. You either believe they're true or not. But I actually don't think we can sustain this new experiment we're embarking on of cutting off all the civic virtues from all of their roots and still hoping somehow or other that we'll maintain these civic virtues. That's a very powerful statement that you make. Let's hope that what we will see from the aggressive secularists by way of response to those sorts of statements is more of let's explore what you've said, let's challenge it. If they've got a better way, let's see what it is rather than these sort of personal attacks that usually respond, you know, that usually follow, which is a great pity. But in that same article, to build on this, I mean, you, you, you certainly said some pretty strong things. Politics in most Western nations is broken. Now, from a very experienced observer of Australian life, that's a profound thing to say. It happens to mesh with what people tell me in the street all the time in various ways. They're really concerned about where we've got to. Yes, I think uh, there is a general crisis across the West in politics. Uh, again, to quote Henry Kissinger, he, he makes the point that no Western government any longer can ask anything of its people in terms of sacrifice. So um, typically a government might say, well, look, we've got a bit of a budgetary problem. We've got to cut back quite a lot of programs that we think are worthwhile and that you've benefited from in order to get everything fixed up and hopefully down the track we'll be in a better position. And you could look the electorate in the eye and say that and the electorate would, would give you a chance and say, okay, well, let's see. Kissinger argues no, no Western government can do that anymore. We're seeing this all over Western Europe. So this is, to be mechanistic about it, this is one reason we're getting into this endless debt and deficit crisis. But that's, that's at the mechanistic level. I think the crisis is at the cultural level. We've lost a sense of higher purpose. We've lost a sense of sacrifice for a higher purpose. We've lost a sense of common purpose. And we're losing a sense of, of all of us being human beings, basically people of goodwill. I don't think the people who disagree with me are bad people. I hope they don't think I'm a bad person. But the tone of our debate is incredibly abusive all the time. And every politician from every party is painted as a corrupt, self-seeking, uh, essentially evil person. And one thing, one of the elements of human nature which is, shows our fallen state, as it were, it's much easier to tear something down and to tear someone down than it is to build, to build someone up. So, um, you know, the idea that our leaders have feet of clay, well, of course they do. But on the other hand, they're good human beings doing their best. I, I've never met anyone in politics in 40 years of journalism that I thought was not uh, well motivated at the start of their career and, you know, some of them met some troubles along the way. But I, I don't think anyone was in it, you know, <clears throat> other than to do some good for their country and their community. I must say, in all those years that I was in the federal parliament, one of the things I noticed about you was that you debate an issue vigorously, but you'd almost never personalise it. And in fact, like I think one of your heroes, G.K. Chesterton, you enjoyed the public debate and you kept the rancour out of it. You avoided this terrible trap you've just referred to, where we judge the morality and the worth of another person by their policy, not by their character. Well, it's kind of you to make that observation, John. I'm very acutely aware of the times when I've failed in that regard. And uh, I've always bitterly regretted it. And um, about 15 or 20 years ago, I remember having a television debate uh, with someone and being really tough and vicious. I wasn't exactly, uh, you know, personalising it against that person's virtue or worth as a human being, but it was a very tough and vicious debate. And at the end, for a stupid second, I preened with uh, congratulation at all my acerbic wit, self-congratulation. The next day in the office, everyone I met, they were all kind to me, but they all kind of said, ah, oh, mate, you were, you were very tough last night on TV. And uh, I realised that was something I was kind of ashamed of, and I've tried not to repeat that uh, ever, ever since. 
Well, that's the mark of something we used to celebrate in this country, not being on yourself. In other words, displaying a bit of humility. One of the things I've noticed over my lifetime in Australia is that we're losing that sense of not being on yourself. And part of it, I think, John, is a sense of humour. Yeah. You know, where William Buckley, the great conservative writer in America, once ran for the uh, mayorship of New York and he was running to make a point, you know, he had no chance of winning. Someone said to him, what will you do if you win? And he said, I'll demand a recount. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I think, I think you can... Boris Johnson, people are very polarised by Boris Johnson. Once a BBC journalist said something about him that was quite outrageous and he even got into trouble from the BBC. And Johnson said, well, look, let's not make too much of this. If a, if a BBC journalist can't have a crack at a Tory minister, it's a, it's a pretty pass we've come to, isn't it? You know, Now, it's very hard to be good-humoured. It's, it's something that is worth working at. You know, Benjamin Franklin said he couldn't... He never could really be humble, but he could pretend to be humble. And that was almost as good because you still got the benefit of listening to other people's opinion and so forth. Uh, and uh, I, I wish there were more of that uh, in our public life. Humour and good humour, they, they often go together. You're right about Chesterton. Chesterton and George Bernard Shaw used to debate each other up and down England about all kinds of great profound issues and they were the best of friends. You know, yeah. Christmas cards, birthday cards. They enjoyed it's, it, agreed on almost nothing. Yeah. They and remained good friends. Yeah, had a genuine concern for each other's uh, health, you know, would, would write to each other if they were sick and, and so forth. They were quick-witted. They were very sharp. I mean, I, I really love Chesterton and, you know, it's a bit lame. There, there's a certain carter of people around the world who are very devoted to Chesterton. So the, the authors I love most, George Orwell, uh, P.G. Wodehouse, Anthony Powell, Malcolm Muggeridge, G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis. Chesterton was such, so witty and so clever that there's a tremendous danger in over-quoting him. So I, I almost have to say to myself, you know, one frank reference to Chesterton a month. And other than that, and when I steal his clever lines otherwise, I try to do it a bit anonymously. It looks like he's the only person you've ever read otherwise. I love that line. Uh, I think uh, he said to George Bernard Shaw one day, uh, you're so thin, you look, it, it looks like there's a famine in England, <laughs> to which Sh uh, Shaw shot back at the very large uh, G.K. Chesterton. Well, it looks like you were responsible for the famine. <laughs> that's a great... That's a great uh, his, his aph Chesterton's aphorisms are, are endless. Uh, one was... Somebody said to him, you're as dull as ditch water. And he said, ditch water is not dull, it teems with life and so on. But, but one of his aphorisms, which I've always tried to live by, is his remark, anything that is worth doing is worth doing badly. And of course, he wasn't suggesting that you set out to do something badly. But what he was saying was, even though you're probably not going to do it that well, have a go. It's very important that it just be done. And... Uh, I've always found that a hugely encouraging uh, 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 injunction from Chesterton and one I've lived up to uh, fully, let me tell you. I think he once said something to the effect that uh, when people stop believing in God, they start believing in anything. And you might have been had that in the back of your mind when you said this. When people are newly accustomed to believe in nothing, they certainly don't believe in old-fashioned institutions such as parliaments and old-fashioned concepts such as compromise. And you went on to say, we're truly living through the postmodern age. As French sociologist uh, Jean, Jean uh, Bourgillard argued, postmodernism is particularly weak in five qualities, depth, coherence, meaning, authenticity and originality. I suspect that's where we really are at at the moment. Are we living, what is this postmodern age? that we're living through. And what does it mean for the person in the street who wouldn't know what the term really meant? I, I came upon that quote, John, uh, through um, interviewing a wonderful Cistercian Trappist monk in Melbourne, Michael Casey. So the most acute analysis of society comes to me from a, from a contemplative monk who spends his whole life in contemplative prayer. He wrote a beautiful book called uh, Strangers to the City. And He's thought deeply about postmodernism. Postmodernism rejects several fundamental tenets of Western civilization. One is it rejects a grand narrative. 
So it, it rejects the possibility of a coherent narrative. Yet we all try to make a coherent narrative of our, of our own lives, and we all try to make a coherent narrative of our own society. It rejects the, the possibility of a coherent narrative. It also rejects the objectivity of truth. Now, Christianity is a great friend of reason, a great friend of science historically, because it said the world is not superstitious, it's not full of warring spirits, it's created by God and it has an order which reflects the mind of God. And discovering that order is the impulse to rational scientific inquiry. Postmodernism rejects the very basis of the thinking which leads to that sort of inquiry because it says your truth is different from my truth. Uh, if you think there's a cup on the table, I might think it's really a vase and you're not right and I'm not right or you're not wrong and I'm not wrong. Everything is plastic. Everything is fluid. Everything is negotiable. Our culture now is fluid. You can't grab hold of it. it it's always disappearing through your fingers. It's interesting, the institutions which absolutely have to reject postmodernism are the military and the police. I mean, the guy is either guilty of the murder or not. The courts can't deal with postmodernism. They have to deal with, with reality. Uh, did this crime get committed or not? Is the man guilty or not? They even have to deal with metaphysical reality. We have to decide if he's guilty or not. The soldier in Afghanistan can't say, well, you know, this is not really a bullet. It's just a perception of a bullet. If he gets hit by the bullet, he'll get killed. And uh, so he has to deal with, and I think that's one reason the military has retained its affection all over the Western world, because somehow or other it rebuts this uh, philosophy without, without having to get, uh, to get into that philosophy. Postmodernism and allied philosophies now dominate the academy in the humanities. You, you can't do it in engineering. You know, you can't build a bridge which might stand or might fall. It has to work. But you can do it in the humanities. So the great traditional quest of the humanities, which is for truth and beauty, is rebutted by postmodernism because postmodernism doesn't believe in truth and it really doesn't believe in beauty. It just believes that uh, there are subjective sensations. And when you lose the uh, concept of truth and beauty, you very often just search for intensity. And mankind on a mindless search for intensity is a very ugly thing. Just feeding into this, uh, what you call the loss of prestige of democracy and the loss of faith in democracy as Lowy points to amongst young people. Yes, I think it does. Uh, it's a startling thing now that um, a lot of Lowy polls have shown at least a plurality and sometimes a majority of young people don't believe democracy is a good system. Uh, there are polls just out of the American midterm elections which show that most Americans don't believe the American system is well designed or works uh, for them. Um, the, uh, the whole of Western Europe is awash with movements which reject the idea that you should obey laws. If Parliament makes a law, you, you should obey the law. Um, so the essential idea that, that winners don't take all and that losers don't lose all and that we abide by the rules and that the contest is somehow or other fair, uh, that's being washed away. And what is replacing it, I think, on the left is a, a coercive, illiberal um, enforcement of ideology. And what I fear will replace it on the right is the sensibility and the coarseness of the mob. Uh, so the left is not going to triumph forever. That's not the danger. The left will produce a reaction. But I often quote the splendid columnist Ross Douthat who said, if you didn't like the religious right in America, you just wait till you meet the post-religious right. And it's, it's not going to be a conflict-free society ruled by Harvard professors. Uh, it's going to be a very ugly conflict, whereas democratic politics manages conflict and ma makes it orderly. So out of the sort of postmodernist thought, it seems to me, if I can test you with this theory, uh, we 
don't think coherently, we lack tradition, we're unaware of our history, of the undergirdings of our freedoms, perhaps not even very focused on our freedoms. What you've seen is a sort of quite frightening rise of narcissism and the emergence of tribalism, even atomization in our society. How does that relate to another observation you've made recently, which is that as a foreign affairs writer, our interest in the world and what happens beyond our shores is at a very, very low level, perhaps the lowest you've seen. Well, here's another paradox of the age we live in, that we have more technological access to the world and less interest in it than ever before. So um, social media is an element of the atomising of society. Uh, you, if you are fixated on the Kardashians or Marvel superheroes or whatever it is, you need never participate in the public square whatsoever. Um, because social media is designed to uh, not only respond to but also manipulate your existing prejudices, unless you are already an international affairs, uh, you know, tragic or aficionado, uh, it, it won't give you anything like that. Um, so I've been foreign editor since 1992 and I, I think the public has never been sort of less interested in Asia, for example. They're interested in China to some extent, we recognise Indonesia is important to some extent, and we recognise India is important. But I can remember in 1992 writing about the Philippines presidential election, and it was front page news, not because it was particularly controversial, but just because you were naturally interested in the Philippines national election. Uh, you know, I think the Australian is a wonderful newspaper, it's a tremendous privilege to work there. But if I write now a, a sort of, uh, you know, what I would, you know, uh, vaingloriously hope is a scintillating analysis of Thai politics, it'll get 17, 17 responses on the, on the blog. I can write, Donald Trump is a duck, and it'll get 2,000 responses. And one of the elements of Trump is that he, like Obama in my view, he uses the dynamics of celebrity to run politics. And I think if politics becomes a celebrity business, it's going to be very, uh, very unsatisfactory. But a mature engagement with international affairs, the one saving grace in Australia is that our migrants give us a connection internationally. That's, that's a great thing. So does our business to some extent. But a broad public policy discussion about Southeast Asia, for example, is, uh, is less evident now in Australian life, I think, than it was in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so progress is not linear. You don't always go, go forward. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you go backwards. Well then, let's go to the really big picture here and pull all of this together. We're atomised, we're fractured, we're intent, it seems, on demolishing one another in a way that really distresses me as an Australian who thinks we should be focusing on the things that unite us and that we have in common rather than the things that divide us. Surely we ought to be absolutely united as Australians, regardless of where you come from or the colour of your skin or your ethnic background or where you stand on the great social debates of the day. In our concern to make certain that we are grappling with the vastly different world that we now live in. As Foreign Affairs Editor, you know just how different it is. You've written about this. I think the world now looks very unsettled. It looks quite dangerous. It's very uncertain. You've effectively now got a multipolar world with a number of quite powerful uh, and very troubling uh, governments and peoples around the world that could launch all sorts of attacks. But most of all, we've got a trade war and effectively care of Vice President Pence's speech to the Hudson Institute a little while ago in America a second Cold War. We seem oblivious to it, and yet the real issues that confront the nation should be uniting us and should be focusing us on the need to pull together. I think that's right, John. I, I would pay a certain tribute to our political leadership in that they've maintained broad bipartisanship that's on key national security issues. So, you know, I think I think very well of Bill Shorten in that regard, in, in, in the national security space. I said to him once, Bill, I'm very happy to 
give my nation over to you in national security terms, but I'm very dubious about your industrial relations ideas. And he was kind enough to say, mate, I feel just the same about you. <laughs> and, uh, which, was, which was very sweet of him, I thought, really. But um, there is no doubt that this is the most challenging international environment that Australia has faced at least since the Vietnam War. And, well, certainly since the end of the Cold War, but I think specifically for us since the Vietnam War. Let's just tick off the challenges. Uh, you've got a United States which is still overwhelmingly powerful, but its, its strategic direction is unclear. It's unclear. Trump has not been as bad in terms of alliance uh, management and so forth as I feared he might be. But um, he came into office talking down US alliances. So at the very least, you've got a lack of clarity and, and American strategic uh, strength and commitment has underpinned the global order, at least since World War II and in a sense for Australia for a hundred years, you know, since Teddy Roosevelt sent the Great White Fleet, since the US acquired the Philippines and became a great Asian power, a great naval power. So that's number one. Number two, you've got the rise of China. Uh, China has done a lot of things that are very, very perplexing. It's taken over territory in the South China Sea, it's militarised that territory. According to all of our government and intelligence experts, it engages in very sustained cyber theft and cyber attacks. It's massively building up its military and uh, it's all designed to, to counter the US military in the region. And it's embarked on a new round of repression at home. Repression of Christians, repression of dissidents, repression of Muslims. Um, With massive surveillance of machinery. Massive, massive surveillance. It's creating the surveillance state, which George Orwell brilliantly forecast in 1984, even before the technology really existed. Uh, so you've got a big challenge from China. You've got a number of revisionist states that are challenging the status quo very severely or challenging the national order. Russia uh, invading and taking territory in the Ukraine, apparently behind these uh, attacks on uh, former Russians in, in Salisbury. You've got Iran uh, sponsoring terrorism in Europe, sponsoring Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, nuclear proliferation is very hard to contain. North Korea has become a nuclear weapons state. I see no prospect of denuclearization in North Korea, absolutely none at all. <clears throat> Iran, I think, is on a path to become a nuclear weapons state. The Saudis are on a hair trigger. They apparently have the ability to, to access the technology from, from Pakistan and go down the nuclear weapons road if they want. Meanwhile, all the nuclear weapons states are updating and expanding their, their arsenal. You've got a continuing threat from Islamist terrorism. We've, we've defeated ISIS on the battlefield for the moment, but if you look at all the years since 9-11, there are now tens if not hundreds of thousands of jihadists across North Africa and the Middle East committed to the Al-Qaeda ISIS vision, which was not the case in 9-11. So since 9-11, we've been successful in stopping another mass attack in a Western society. We haven't been successful in stopping that ideology. And then at the same time, we've got a breakdown of uh, Ilan belief effectiveness in our own societies and our national leaderships. Are we strong enough to uh, navigate all these challenges? Uh, there is an arms race in our own region. The Indo-Pacific um, is massively increasing arms expenditure, massively increasing submarine uh, capability. Our defence effort, <coughs> although it's improving, I think it's still very anemic. You know, one of the reasons I'm a very pro-immigration person is for national security. I want us to be a bigger, stronger nation. Now, all of this is happening, and uh, it is true that it only very faintly registers on Australian national consciousness. Now, not everything is bad, of course. Lots of, lots of good things happening. We've got good relations with, with most of our neighbours, and most of them are becoming more affluent, and you could say perhaps more stable. Uh, so, so there are good things as well, but this is a very challenging environment. So perhaps uh, it's worth reflecting on this. If we believe in ourselves and we value our freedoms and indeed value our values, surely we would be prepared to defend them 
even to considerable cost. Have we yet focused enough on the real prospect that our complacency, take the fact that we've spent 10 years agonising over an order for submarines, take the fact that we don't even have our strategic fuel reserves in place, have we been so complacent, are we being so complacent, that we're inviting real trouble? I think we have been uh, really wickedly complacent about our own national security. This is partly because we rely so completely on the Americans. Now, the American alliance is overwhelmingly in Australia's national interest. Uh, you know, our, our defence forces are 20-fold more effective than they would be without the American alliance for logistics, spare parts, intelligence. By intelligence, I don't mean spies, I mean real-time intelligence about, you know, which ships are leaving which ports at what time and all the rest of it. But beyond that, um, any potential adversary knows that we're an ally of the United States. So it's not a question of what they could do to Australia and get away with in terms of our retaliation. I mean, could we secure our resources on the Northwest Shelf if somebody decided to, to take them away from us? Uh, that, I think that's an open question, really. But uh, everyone has to factor in the US alliance. Now, the US alliance has made us lazy and complacent. We, we need it. One of Donald Trump's complaints, which is true, the same complaint that George W. Bush and Barack Obama made is that the Allies are not pulling their weight. They rely on the Americans, they consume American security, they don't contribute to American security. Now, I, I think Trump overdoes this critique, but there is a measure of justice uh, in what he says. And um, you're right, it's, it's taken us 10 years and we still haven't signed the final contract with the uh, submarine provider that we've chosen, the French. Yet in our defence white paper of 2008 or 2009, whenever it was, we said as a nation under the Rudd government that it was a matter of the highest urgency to acquire these high performing submarines. And, you know, for reasons that are a little technical, submarines are a very, very important element of the defence of a maritime nation like Australia. They're a very asymmetric weapon. They can do things to your opponents which uh, it's very difficult for your opponents to stop and therefore you hope that never happens but your opponents have to take that into account all the time. They, they provide a level of defence and deterrence and so on and of course they are the best defence against other submarines. There are very, very compelling reasons why Australia needs capable submarines and it has been a shocking failure of national policy this story uh, over 10 years. Whether then we have the determination to defend ourselves. I just read a lovely novel called Scarpia by Piers Paul Reed, which is set in, in the time of the opera Tosca. And uh, the hero comments that Florence at that time is a very sybaritic, indulgent, corrupt place. And he says, it's not a bad life in a way, if you like that sort of thing. But he said, I'm not sure that sybaritism itself is something that men will die for. And uh, I think, again, that question is raised. Are we strong enough to withstand the challenge of much more vigorous societies? Because our competitor societies have not lost their self-belief. Greg, part of the purpose of these conversations is we've discovered that a lot of young people are very interested in it. Now, the last thing you or I would want is for them to think, gee, they're painting such a bleak picture that there's no hope. In fact, I'd much rather have them say, look, here are the challenges, but see them as challenges and mountains to be tackled and to overcome uh, and to be positive about and to spend your life usefully trying to improve, if you like. What grounds for optimism would you uh, point uh, young people to? Well, John, I, I am inherently a very optimistic person personally. I have a very Irish temperament. Situation desperate, advance on all fronts. And, uh, <laughs> My book, God is Good For You, I think really uh, is optimistic in the face of this difficult analysis and for a couple of reasons. There's a chapter called something like Signs of New Life and although there has been this ambient decline in Christian belief in the West, Christianity is full of movements that are full of life, that are tremendously dynamic and I, I sketch a few of them in this book. I mean, the Pentecostal churches are spectacular. I'm so impressed with them. Their, their ability to, to communicate a traditional message 
in a modern way. I mean, a lot of churches that try to get modern in their communications end up diluting their message. The, the Pentecostals that I write about don't dilute their message, but they're brilliant at, at you know, their use of social media, their use of music and so on. There are in the Catholic Church what are called new, new ecclesial movements. <clears throat> One of them I describe focolare, which is people just trying to live according to the gospel. It's a lay movement. It's always led by a woman. It's constitution. It has an equal number of men and women, but it's always led by a woman has millions of, millions of adherents around the world. Now this doesn't, in numbers terms, compensate for the ambient decline in Christianity, but there are dozens or hundreds of such movements. I, I visit a, a Benedictine monastery, which has tripled in size since the time I visited it, a new monastery in Tasmania, full of brilliant young men who could do anything, full of life and energy and great university degrees and so forth, but they've decided to spend their whole lives in contemplative prayer and, and, uh, and good works within the context of their monastery. Uh, and this passionate idealism of young people. So, uh, you know, the, the Christian movements I found that were successful had three features. They had a very clear message, that very strong leadership that was willing to communicate the message clearly, and they had a form of worship that was um, aesthetically beautiful and whose aesthetic beauty suggested the moral beauty. There are Anglican and evangelical parish planting operations in Perth that I wrote about that are fantastically um, promising. Now that's, that's in a sense a rational, uh, limited but, but striking cause for optimism within the story of Christianity. But then the other cause for optimism, John, is this. God is cleverer than his enemies and he finds a way into human hearts and human hearts find a way to him, which is beyond, uh, you know, demographic analysis and so forth. It's right for us to deal with demographic analysis and the like because that's, you know, we're operating in the rational world and that's, that's it. Christianity has had rough times before, much rougher than what we're enduring and it's always been great on the rebound. And uh, uh, so I think it's, it's what my friends in the Air Force would call a target-rich environment, certainly full of challenges, but it's full of hope. And in the end, you know, Christians are trying to tell the truth and there is in within each human being a constituency for the truth. So they have an enormous natural advantage, notwithstanding all the, all the difficulties that I otherwise sketch. Greg, uh, you make an enormous contribution to public debate in Australia. I recommend whenever young people say to me, if I want to understand what's happening, who do I read? You, amongst one or two others. Uh, thank you for the contribution you make more broadly. Thank you for joining me in this conversation. Thanks very much, John. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.